Yeah, hi. First of all, I want to thank uh, Ty and, and Naeem to, to have us present in uh, front of the esteemed crowd. Uh, we're really honored uh, to be speaking in front of you. And uh, just by way of introduction, uh, I have uh, 25 years uh, plus of experience uh, working both in public accounting, big four national firms, as, as well as uh, working as a corporate controller uh, for private companies, as well as a company that uh, assistant controller we took uh, public, raised about almost $200 million. So, uh, and uh, now with uh, grants for almost uh, a year, and uh, you know, trying to help work with startup companies uh, such as yours. Uh, Shana uh, is, is, is my esteemed colleague. Uh, she is the CFO uh, in our advisory practice. Uh, she's also had 25 years of experience uh, with, uh, with the firm. And she's been there for four years, seven years as, uh, as the CFO. Uh, Shana, do you want to speak a little bit about yourself? Or? Sure, I, we actually, oh my gosh, this is loud. We have very similar backgrounds. So I was also in um, public accounting at the beginning of my career and have worked both with um, privately held and public companies in a variety of different positions. Um, and now I'm one of the CFOs at Crowns. Thank you. Working with Vishnu. And also I would like to introduce you to Patty Aguilar. Uh, she is the managing director uh, in the technical accounting practice. Uh, we, we are very lucky to have her. Uh, she has worked uh, 20 plus years with uh, Deloitte, including with their uh, national uh, practice, worked with a lot of public companies, uh, a lot of companies that have gone on here. And also in the room, I do see a couple of our uh, other colleagues. Mike Bersotti is also a CFO, uh, in case if you have any questions. And also we have Christina Bui. Uh, with uh, with uh, with grants, she's at the back of the room. So, in case if you would like to uh, talk, get to know each other a little bit, yeah, they'll they'll be around. All right, should we kick it off? You have that. Oh, I think it's you. Oh, does it go this way, or so does, does it have to? Do you have to aim it towards that? Go the mic. Okay, I'll cover this while he's getting remiked. So um, our agenda today is we're going to talk a little bit about why finance is important. Vishnu's going to walk you through kind of the basics of the various financial statements. We're going to talk about some um, gap considerations and um, and stock option considerations, and then we're going to talk about modeling, business modeling, and forecasting, and we will wrap it up with a little bit of a discussion on revenue recognition and the new rules that are coming down the pipe. Do the next one. All right. Why is finance important? Why why do Vishnu and I and a handful of other people do this? Um, I would say that a strong financial partner is um, a really essential thing for an entrepreneur to rely on when they're trying to figure out what to do with their scarce resources, which is your time and your cash. Um, Accurate financials are extremely important to make to make good financial decisions, and it's really important also to create a model that helps you in your business and tells you when you need to fundraise, when you're going to run out of cash, um, when you're going to run into issues. A model also can help you as you're doing your various um, return on investment analysis. So when you're trying to make a decision among two really good alternatives, it's great to put together a model to try to figure out which is most profitable and which is most appealing to you. All right, it's you. Yeah, so before we get into some basics of financial statements, I just wanted to see, uh, uh, get a sense of the audience over here. Uh, how many of you have had some, some background with uh, finance or have worked with uh, some financial uh, people in your organization? So I do see a, see a few of them. Uh, so yes, yeah, some of the information may be a little bit basic uh, for you. So just just bear with us. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to to interrupt and let us know. So yeah. So before we get into some of the basic financial statements, uh, just to give you a background, uh, the rulemaking body in the U.S. for uh, for financial statement presentation is uh, FASB, which is Financial Accounting Standards Board. Uh, it's applicable both to public and private companies. Uh, in addition to uh, FASB, uh, we also have SEC, but that's more applicable to public companies. We don't need to worry about that at the moment. Uh, maybe that's another session at some point of time, but generally the rules are called as uh, a gap, which is gen generally accepted accounting principles. You must have heard it or you'll hear it in your lifetime. 
uh, the financials are there in accordance with uh, US GAAP. Uh, having said that, uh, let's take a look at, so generally, you know, before I proceed, uh, generally the, the FASB or the accounting board would uh, require four financial statements, right? Uh, in that's, that's GAAP, right? So that's your balance sheet, your profit and loss statement, your uh, statement of cash flows, and you have also your uh, your statement of stockholders' equity. So we will not pay attention to statement of stockholders', uh, stockholders equity uh, because I understand that most of you are startups. You're not getting into any of the audit situation very soon. That's something that we'll, we'll worry about at some point of time. And of course, they are looking at your cap table. So you know where you stand in terms of uh, funding. So we'll pay attention more to uh, the balance sheet and you know, in income statement and uh, uh, the statement of uh, cash flow. So I'll just use this over here. Uh, so to begin with, do you want me to um, do it? I can do it for you. Yeah. So the balance sheet, uh, as we call it, as it gives you uh, a, a the, the picture of a financial position of a company at a particular point in time, right? So uh, you have your annual financial statements, right? So it's December thirty first for most, uh, or you have a quarterly financial statement. Uh, you know that would be at the end of each quarter, March thirty first, uh, you know June thirtieth. So on, or you know, many of the investors, or even you would like to take a look at it uh, on a monthly statement. So that, as of the end of the month, would be your uh, your financial uh, you know position. That's that's your balance sheet. And typically, and we'll, we'll take a look at it. It's asset equal. It's a simple math. Assets equal to liability plus uh, owner's equity uh, in the balance sheet. Next. So what we have done over here is we have given you a snapshot of a balance sheet um, and. Uh, this is how your balance sheet, a typical balance sheet will look like for, for most of these startups, right? Uh, it will get a little bit more complicated as, as you grow, but we don't want to get into, uh, into too many details. Uh, but having taken a look at it, uh, uh, let's take a look at your assets. Cash by far is the most as important asset of a company, whether it's a startup or it's a public company or it's a matured company, right? And that's the single most important asset. Cash is king. Cash is king, that's right. Um, then you have net uh, AR for, you know, for, for you can take a look at this over here, it's, it's blank because if you're a startup, you're trying to develop a technology. Uh, AR is basically uh, nothing but uh, the receivable, uh, as you call it as accounts receivable, for sales made uh, to customers, right? So this is, of course, a startup it doesn't have AR unless and until it's, it's, it's a company that does all credit card sales, right? So you don't have any AR, right? So that's a good position to be in as well. Uh, prepaid uh, assets, uh, you know, generally those are the assets you pay in advance of incurring the expense. Your, your, uh, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is insurance, right? You pay a year in advance, but you are recognizing the expense over a period of time. Uh, so that's where you are generally look, uh, prepaid. Uh, you know, before I get into inventory, how many of you are just wanted to get a countdown on, on, on people uh, if they do are in the business of selling tangible goods? So are there any? Uh, you know, attendees over here. So we do have a couple of hands over here. Uh, we have two, three hands over here. So for most of you in the room, actually, practically everybody, you know, this will be a new item. So it's only if you're selling tangible goods, that's what it will show up on your uh, balance sheet, right? It's, it's the products that you'll be selling to customers in the normal course of business. And uh, hopefully in the next, you know, less than 12 months, right? I mean, you want to be in a position whereby your inventory is turning fast. And, uh, you're selling it, it fast. So, moving along, uh, you have uh, uh, fixed assets. You know, fixed assets uh, are, are your, uh, your 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 equipment that you purchase. Uh, uh, then you also have your leasehold improvements. So those are the assets uh, that we have. The capitalize in the books instead of just expensing it on on day one. And the reason you do it, uh, capitalize it is is because it has value. Uh, and it is used in your uh, uh, over a period of time, right? Uh, so you you capitalize it. Um, so that's that's typical, uh, you know, your your assets. Uh, then you will move along to uh, liabilities. Typically, I will, I will not spend too much of time here. Uh, your accounts payable. You know, you pay your your vendors. Uh, generally, that's your consultants, uh, your legal attorneys, your accountants, etc. So that's where you're going to record. 
uh, accrued expenses are expenses that you have incurred but you have not actually received an invoice, right? I mean, uh, for example, you may have received a, a, a good, right, uh, from uh, one of your vendors, but they have not billed you. So typically, you will record it as accrued expenses or oh, your salaries, right? I mean, you pay salaries, right? If you, you, you're paying twice a month on the 15th and 31st, it's okay. But if you pay every two weeks, then you need to uh, accrue for three or four days uh, of the month. That's so that your financial statements are <coughs> properly uh, stated. Notes payable, uh, capital lease, in case if you're interested, uh, we can talk offline as well. It's, 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 uh, generally, it's, uh, uh, you have not paid for outright for uh, your equipment, for <laughs> some of the equipment that you purchased because you want to conserve cash, you're paying it on a monthly basis. So if it meets certain accounting criteria, uh, then it will be recorded as a capital lease. It has to meet some, some criteria. Uh, to do uh, notes payable that's as, as it says it's payment to your lenders uh, and your equity uh, is is nothing but uh, you know the funds that you have received from your investors you have your founders right and you have the founders the common stock uh, your preferred your professional investors and we'll talk a little bit more in, uh, when we are discussing the cap table uh, so I will, I will stop right there and take a look asset goes to liabilities plus uh, and one thing I would point out, Vishnu, is in this particular example, you can see that the notes payable went away in the month of June when the company raised their Series B and brought in $40 million. So this is a situation where they initially had convertible debt from their investors, and it converted over to the Series B. So that's why you see that. So they got $10 million of new money. Thank you. Does anybody have any uh, question? Yeah, on the, on the uh, uh, you have this capital lease. Yeah. Uh, if I am, uh, uh, let's say, Amazon uh, Cloud Services, which is a SaaS, mm -hmm. uh, where where will it go? That will not be leased, right? Yeah. So if you are, if so, if you look at so that typically would be more like an operating lease, like you're paying a rent to access it. So yeah, you will typically you will be expensing it on a monthly basis. Uh, it's typically in the uh, income statement as an expense. Okay, so that yeah. be, because yeah. I can cancel, therefore uh, I don't have, in other words, the monthly. Uh, yeah, correct. And, and, and capital lease generally have some rules like, you know, you have ownership criteria, the life of the lease. Right. So there are like three or four criteria. If you meet one of them, then you have to capitalize uh, the lease because, you know, chances are that you'll be taking ownership at the end of the lease. <laughs> but something like uh, Amazon, it's like a rental agreement that okay. you're paying on a rental basis, right? So yeah. it's a service. Uh, yeah, it's a it's service. service. Yeah. So similarly, uh, the uh, the lease of the building is also going there. Yeah, I, I, generally that's a good point. And on, on, on the lease of a building, uh, you'll take a look at it. It will not be a capital lease. Rules in lease, by the way, uh, that'll be a separate topic. Are changing uh, so in the next two years or so. Uh, but right now, just generally, like yeah. lease your your rental office or something. That's Typically, it's an operating lease, so you're not capitalizing as of now, sir. So, uh, uh, you have already assigned some value to the stockholder equity. Right? Yeah, so the stockholder equity, if you take a look at it, you know, it's it's your, uh, you know, your common stock, what the, the founders have paid. Typically, that's the people uh, who have uh, common stock. And preferred stock is your outside, uh, you know, your outside uh, Investors. Yeah, but for the startups, the founders would have paid like uh, one cent or something. Yeah, that's what. So that's correct. Is this uh, value on that basis? That's correct. That's what we have paid for it. It's yep. cost, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And 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 we'll talk a little bit more on the four hundred nine A because it does impact their employees or something. So we'll we'll get into that section. So I'll shop. Uh, so moving along to the next important uh, statement, that's your income statement. And uh, income statement as, you know, like the balance sheet is, gives you, is an indicator of a financial performance at a point in time. Income statement talks about the financial performance of a company during a period of time, right? I mean, as, uh, you know, of course you want annual statements, but as, as, as founders, you also would like to take a look at uh, uh, monthly statements, right? Your, your, uh, your investors would ask for monthly statement or even quarterly statements in some, some cases, depending on who your investors are. So it gives you a is, 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 is a snapshot. We will we will talk about this is a general you know I mean your company could be a little bit different. So you could 
always tailor it, but the top line item is revenue. Uh, it's about the, one of the biggest, the, the, the most important benchmark for any investor, whether it's public company, whether it's private company. And we will talk briefly about revenue uh, in one of the slides towards uh, the end. So let's, let's hold our thoughts uh, uh, there. Um, then we also, the second thing is then you, you do is uh, you have your cost of sales, right? Cost of selling the product, like, like for, for tangible, uh, it will be the cost of your tangible products, right? So that's where it will get into the cost of sales line item, right? Plus your uh, uh, labor, uh, that's, uh, you know, your, your employee, that's related to selling, so, you know, your, your cost of sales. So one, I, I want to hold a moment over there and talk about gross margins, right? So your revenue less cost of sales is your gross profit, right? Then your gross margin is your gross profit. Uh, many other people get mistaken and they say that your gross profit is cost of sales. It's your gross profit and your denominator is cost of sales. It's, 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 it's related as, as a percentage of cost of sales. Now it's margin is your gross profit uh, calculated as a percentage of revenue. So, uh, and we'll see in, in a couple of slides, but that's a very important indicator for any investor, right? I mean, you want to, they're looking for a company where they can get, you know, 70, 80% margin, because if you have that kind of a margin or 90% margin, guess what? You have more money to spend on other activities without going to them for raising more funds. As founders also, that's important. As opposed to a company that's 20, 30, 40% in margin, then very soon you have limited wiggle room to play with and uh, you go to your investors again to raise another round of funding. So that will become very self-explanatory. Uh, typically, you know, and, and I will also ask Shana for her thoughts, but I have seen many of these startups, right? I mean, they will have you know, they have revenue, cost of sales, etc. Okay, that's that's right. But then everything is lumped into SGNA, right? I mean, selling GNA. But what typically we would be advised to our clients is, you know, let's let's break it down a little bit more, refine it, right? Uh, R and D, you know, what you're spending on your research and development. Of course, that's important for tax credits as well, right? And uh, and then uh, marketing and selling, right? So, and that's typically a public company would also do. So you know where you're spending the money. And GNA is your, you know, your CEO salary, your your, your accounting, legal fees, uh, HR related fees uh, will be GNA. So, this will be a typical uh, how a PNL will look like. And of course, you have your income from operations. That's your other, uh, you know, your your benchmark as to what is your operating uh, margin. So. You know, before I, before I uh, proceed, I also wanted to say that income statement, though it's built income statement, different people call it differently. You will hear it as P&L, profit and loss uh, statement, statement of operations, but it all means the same. Uh, here, net income, that's your accounting income, and we'll talk about cash flow. But there are other measures of profitability, uh, you know, that investors would like to take a look at. EBITDA, you'll hear sometimes EBITDA, your earnings before, Interest, you know, interest taxes, uh, depreciations, and amortization, right? So, because that gives them uh, a view of how the company is doing uh, operationally, right? So, it's uh, a good proxy for cash. You're pulling out non-cash expenses, so your EBITDA is a nice proxy for how much cash you made. Versus net income could have all kinds of other things in it, right? Depreciation is non-cash, and so, um, so that's gotten much more popular, I'd say, over the last decade. And, and the biggest thing is that uh, equity compensation. Uh, that That's right. They do not Which is non-cash, exactly. And we will talk about that. Oh. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So now we go to the next slide. Question. I have a question. On the <coughs> uh, if, you, if you have some, let's say, some funding from an SBIR type of a grant in the RFP, okay. Yep. Is that a revenue? Or is no. That a no, it's, um, it's typically in other income. So typically grant income. Sometimes people, Vishnu and I just had this debate today because we have a client together where that's the situation. So some people will take it as an offset to the research and development costs because oftentimes that's what it's paying for. But I think that's misleading because you're showing someone R&D costs that are below what they really are. And you know, you're know you kidding yourself. So I think the best place personally is to put it as other income, but it's not revenue. It's not in your top line. It goes below the line. 
Yeah, and typically many of the grants are, are, are straightforward. Yeah, it is revenue I've seen in my example as well. Uh, you know, because actually it's, you know, you're actually selling something to the government sometimes, right? I mean, you, may, you will have that contract, like maybe Department of Defense is an example. Uh, but yeah, sometimes they do as an offset. Uh, you know, they will give you for some R&D expenses or even purchase of PP&E, right? Uh, so it depends. So I've also seen the other side, I know it's, it's a judgment area. Uh, whereby you know companies would say, okay, this is a deduction of uh, my expenses. Uh, but to Shauna's point, uh, you know, if you do that, that's not a lifelong uh, expense. It's going to go away somewhere. And if you do a deduction, it's not only a messy, but all of a sudden you'll see a very high jump in your expenses, right? Then you'll have to sit down and explain that, hey, by the way, the reason it was low is because I did get some funding from. Is there, is there an optimal place where you can place that? Generally, other income, uh, you know, again to the yeah, climate. Other income expenses. Other yeah. income and expenses. I mean, you get you get a uh, you get so many extra points for predictability, right? And so I think it's good to to show it there and to call it out. Yeah, and I, I don't want to put Patty on spot, but uh, do you have any thoughts or? Uh, no, I would tend to agree with Shauna uh, yeah. in terms of uh, it, again comparability becomes yeah. a big value to your investors and to the reviewers of your financial statements. So anytime you have very unique uh, one year, one time uh, type uh, circumstances, it's best to uh, put them somewhere where they're more uh, identifiable and visible. Um, <laughs> no question. <laughs> yeah. So gross margin equals um, revenues minus cost of sales divided by revenue. That's the ratio, right? Correct. So in cost of sales, are you including, for example, it's on sale project? Is that uh, cost of? Are you talking about the actual salesperson? Yeah. And the salesperson would be below the line in the sales department, but the cost of the hardware would be part of operation, and the cost of the team of people that manufacture the hardware would be part of that gross margin calculation, and your freight and logistics, but, but the salesperson would go into your sales expense, which is below that line. And is that represented as an aggregate of the company, or if I have to show it for the individual item? So generally, we will, we will take a look at it. Uh, so this is a summary uh, p &L, but behind that, you will have the details, right? And we'll take a look at an example. Uh, you will want to know, even as a, as a founder, how much you have spent on the people, uh, you know, that uh, to, cal to come to the actual gross margin, why is it high or low, and what you can do to make it better, you want to know the breakdown, right? I mean, at the detail level, like you know, it's, it's material cost, is it shipping, where you can, uh, for, for hardware companies, uh, labor, you know, can you make the labor efficient? So yeah, you would like to take a look at it. This is just a summary p and uh, to share it to the external people, but, but, but yeah, absolutely there will be details uh, supporting it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. But I think uh, you raise a good point in that it is, it does take art to really, um, and logic to really define well what should be a cost of your mm -hmm. revenue, right? As we've talked about, and there's a lot of time that you know accountants spend on those kind of concepts, just as you raise. Um, you know, uh, if you're provided some service and you uh, buy some uh, data analytic, you know, management system, and you provide an output from that data analytic management system to your customers, you have to decide, is that management system <clears throat> that I bought, is that something that um, goes into the cost of revenue? And I would argue that it would, because, or at least some aspect of it, because you're using it in a deliverable specifically to your customer. So there, just so you know, there's so much that goes into what we ultimately do classify as a cost of revenue, and it's um, mm -hmm. it's something that you just talk about, and it you know it has to make you know make some logical sense, but ultimately it's the direct <laughs> direct cost in getting your product to your customer, right? So a sales isn't really moving that the sales is just you know uh, basically the sales effort is getting the arrangement but the actual movement ultimately the delivery of the product is what's cost sale if that if that helps any other 
Is it useful for startups to capitalize labor into your standard cost of your item? Um, oftentimes, yeah, because you don't want to kid yourself, right? So if you have something that's labor intensive and you exclude that, then you might think that you have some great gross margin, but the fact of the matter is you don't mm -hmm. because it costs, you know, $50 per unit to make a $50 unit. And so, um, so yeah, the, the problem you run into with startups is the sophistication of your systems. So typically, um, a typical instance of QuickBooks that you might buy and you might not spend a lot of money on isn't really going to support you being able to do these calculations. And so then you need people to help you and you need to do spreadsheets and do kind of some things behind the scenes. But I would argue, um, as an entrepreneur, I'd never want to kid myself. I would want to understand the true nature of my costs and the true nature of my business. So are any wages? Can I capitalize No. Um, you, you expense them. Yeah. Yeah, you're not gonna, you're not going to include the R and D into the cost of the product, just the labor to manufacture the product. Yeah, to add to that, I don't believe there is any accounting rules uh, that would encourage you to to capitalize. That's you know because that's your research and development, right? Expense. Uh, yeah, that's your your expense too. What about in film finance, like when they do flex and film? Uh, a lot of times they'll take the uh, part of that budget will be for R and D that will then go into creating some specific tools that then they'll use in the film. You know what, I have to say movie accounting is totally different than the rest of the world of accounting. There's a very famous case where the movie Forrest Gump that's like so good and so fabulous from a movie accounting perspective lost a fortune. And all these people that were supposed to get the back end got nothing and that is like, it's crazy accounting. So I, I, we probably can't talk to that because the way some of that stuff happens isn't, it's, it's inherent to a particular in industry, and some of it is internal management accounting, not really gap accounting. But in terms of the technology aspect, you're saying it's the, um, like for technology heavy uh, film productions, like visual effects. And, yeah. Right, where they're, uh, um, they, you know, they, they might be building some specialized, you know, software for rendering, for example, and then that's, you know, budgeted from the whole, uh, production expense that would have an R&D component yeah exactly so I so in in the movie industry they might incorporate that into um, their cost of their product into the gross margin if you're doing manufacturing aircraft for example right and there's a new materials you have to develop and you know that's going to have to happen wouldn't that be the same thing as R&D that's R&D. Yeah, yeah, you know, along those points, actually, and, and, and thinking about it a little bit, and, uh, and, and perhaps Patty can add in as well, there are situations if you are a SaaS company, right? I mean, so there are certain costs that you can capitalize. Uh, even if you are a software company, uh, there are certain gap that you can capitalize uh, some of your costs. Uh, but typically, in software company, it doesn't happen uh, because the, the rules are such uh, so detailed. Uh, you know, but but in a SaaS company, yes, and that's one of the things we'll, we will talk is yes, you know, there are certain rules where you will capitalize your internally developed software. So there is there is an example for a SaaS company. Uh, typically, startups do not do it uh, because again, it's the cost of managing uh, the process, and then every year at every period end, you'll have to look for impairment to see if it does have any value. Uh, but it's SaaS. You know, the counting guidance, just to give you a brief, I don't want this to be uh, a topic in internally developed software. Uh, typically, no software, uh, no startup would do it. When they come to an audit, auditors is going to ask you. So there are five stages. Uh, typically, application and development stage is where you will capitalize some of the uh, software. So that's an example. It's good. Thanks for bringing it up. That's an example that will come in. Unless and until you prove it to the auditors, the technology is changing so fast, it's going to become obsolete in 12 months, then they will not. Yeah, much so about, uh, uh, in uh, R and D, supposing uh, it's a software a SaaS company, they spend hundred thousand uh, uh, quarter million in developing a product. Mm -hmm. That is their asset. It is capital asset. Right. So it is not just uh, on expense. Correct. So uh, I think that research is probably the idea and development of the concept. Yeah. 
But beyond that, development, testing, That's correct. all that should be, we should correct. be able to get place. There are certain, certain like application and development stages, one of the things. So we'll take a look at the five stages. Like you said, concept is going to get expensed. So there are other categories that will get expensed, but there is some development stage. Uh, Patty? Right. It ties back to the viability of the product, right? It, right. It, it, it ties back to... You know, are you spending that? You're at the front end. You're spending a lot of effort to just try to see if you have some via, viable product, right? If you're, uh, be it a software product or a tangible product. And once you achieve that, then you start getting into the ability to capitalize the costs. But before you achieve that, you really should be expensing um, that cost. So, and, and he's right, there's different um, stages, and they're very well defined in, in the accounting rules as far as yeah. uh, at what stage can you capitalize versus, you know, do you have to expense? And also within certain stages, there's certain costs that always get capitalized. Like say you have to train your people on how to, you know, use the, the whatever you're working on, whatever the software you're working on, that the training always gets expensed because it's not adding any more benefit to your product. And to that point, subsequently, when you add additional functionality, you, you may you will spend more money into your software. It's not that it's a one-time deal. You want to develop uh, the, the the product, right? So as and when it adds functionality to the software, the basic guideline would be if it does add any value or something. Again, this is very you know very uh, at a high level. Yeah, you will capitalize some of those costs. But again, you'll have to look at uh, the advance in the accounting world is. You will look at it on an annual basis or period basis and see, is that asset good, right? I mean, does it really have a value? So you look for what we call it as impairment, right? So. Uh, quick question. Yeah. So what about loyalty payments? Uh, where do they fall? Uh, so can you enhance a little bit more on your questions? So basically, if you pay loyalty to somebody, right? So where does that fall into this? That typically, and I will also have uh, uh, Shana and, and, and Barry chime in. Typically, if the royalty payment, I'm assuming, is you're paying for to, for the product that you're selling, it will get into cost of sales uh, because that's your cost that you're incurring uh, for uh, selling the product. You're paying somebody for that, so that'll be a part of your cost of sales. But I would, I would, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in some cases it can be characterized differently because maybe it's a different type of royalty. But if it's but, not to do with your your revenue idea, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> so this is just to give you uh, a picture of the importance of uh, gross margin. And Shana pointed out to me when we were looking at it, oh, this is Madoff in jail. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so yeah, this, this is just a snapshot of the income statement. And just, just the idea is to show you uh, what a company with high gross margins can do. Uh, so if you take a look at Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, same company. They were only at a 2% uh, gross margin. Look, uh, their uh, net loss, uh, 2 million. As they increased their uh, profitability, excuse me, the gross margin, uh, paying attention to their cost, right? Of course, the revenue has also increased uh, uh, in this example. When you take a look at it, uh, you know, it's very nice, healthy margin. That's, that's the position that typically you want to be in. Just to give you an example that, and, and most of these, the uh, expenses are pretty much remained flat, right? I mean, R&D in this example has actually decreased, right? And uh, uh, sales and marketing has increased slightly and GNA is flat. So yeah, pretty flat operating expenses, good growth in margins. Look at the impact at the bottom. Now that's the situation you want to be. Yeah. yeah. So we'll go to uh, cash flow uh, statement. So the third statement would be your your uh, cash flow. Uh, that again gives you a picture of uh, your performance of a company during a period of time, right? Uh, just like the income statement. So uh, cash flow is, is is very important as as a founder. That's what you want to look at. Uh, actually, for that matter, any company uh, and cash flow uh, begins uh, where your net income. Uh, ends right, so it begins with net income uh, or net loss, uh, and then you reconcile the balance uh, uh, balance sheet items. So it's three. I will not get into too much of details. It's it's just like three uh, segments: cash flow from operating activities. That's what you get from selling your uh, product and less expenses. Then you do investing. That's your 
PPNE, you invest in uh, your, your, uh, your purchases, and then your financing activities. That's your you know fundraising, you know your common stock and uh, uh, preferred stock, and less dividends. You know if you pay dividends, typically you will not pay any dividends uh, or, or, or payment of, of, of debt. So. So, uh, excuse me. so uh, when they said that a company is a cash flow positive, but is still showing a loss, which one of these are they talking about? So uh, that's a very good question. So, so th it's a very, very good point. So you could be making, accounting wise, tons of money, right? Because that's your accrual accounting. Now you're saying, uh, but you may not be receiving money, right? I mean, you may not. Uh, you may not uh, be, you know, your, your creditors are not paying you in time, etc. So you might, company may actually go out of business even if you have, uh, you know, your uh, accounting income is, is, is positive. On the contrary, even if you're making a loss, but you're making good cash flow, uh, you're managing your cash flow, yeah, you have a lot of leeway to, to go around with. So to say that if they're making money cash-wise, I would say because that's your uh, cash flow from operating activities. Maybe move it difference. one forward. There's uh, an example. That's, that's uh, the operating activities, right? So you'll take a look at net income, net loss, adjusted for non-cash like depreciation items, and then you're adjusting for your change in assets and liabilities, your AR, yeah, like your operations, right? So typically, you know, to answer your question and say they're making money, uh, that would be a cash flow from operations. That's what you want that to be positive. Unfortunately for this company, they're losing money, it's negative uh, cash flow. Uh, that's the reason that they have, you know, and then you look at the purchase of equipment, and that's the reason they had to go back and do some fundraising activities to support the uh, the cash used in operations and the financing activities. So yeah, you want that to be, you know, positive. Uh, a, a good example of what you're saying, where um, a company may or may not be profitable, but is cash flow positive, is um, could be a company that has a nice stream of revenue where, where customers prepay, right? So say you have a software service and your customers typically prepay a year in advance, that doesn't show up as your revenue until you earn it. So it shows up as revenue over the months, but you get the cash up front. And if you have a growing customer base, you could you could be making all kinds of money, but you don't get to call it revenue until it's earned. And it shows up in your balance sheet as a liability. So when is it earned versus a customer pay? Yeah, yeah, and it's a, that's a hugely important distinction. So um, I'll let Vishnu has a slide later on revenue that walks you through all the criteria. But but essentially, if it's software, if it's a SaaS software business, typically you provide a, a software for a month, and at the end of the month, you've earned one month's worth of the revenue. But oftentimes, people will pay you, especially if you can, if you can get away with it, you know, get them to pay you as much upfront as possible. Um, and so then you you could you could be in a situation where you have a 36 month deal and someone chooses to pay you for 36 months ahead of time. So you get all that cash and then you recognize it over the next three years. Oh, okay. so it's as the service is concerned, exactly every month. And so it's it's a very detailed spreadsheet every month. Yeah. Okay. yeah revenue revenue is, is is a different topic. We'll, we'll touch on it. It gets extremely extremely complex. Uh, and we'll, we'll touch on it and yeah so getting money and earning or recognizing revenue is two different th uh, two different things yeah. so like uh, the annual maintenance uh, contracts right for exactly the customer is paying them in advance yes maybe on a quarterly basis yes one you would yeah. for sure yeah so that's that's again like it's a it's a simplistic scenario but it gets a little bit more if you're a SaaS company uh, and again, I don't want to, to, to talk too much about revenue. We can have a little bit more discussion. But, you know, what exactly are you selling? If it's a widget, right? I mean, you're selling just a uh, widget and you sell it and you ship it, you recognize revenue. But along with that, you have your maintenance contract, your warranty services, professional services. Then you get into a very different uh, area. Then, uh, unfortunately, the accounting rules get a little bit more complex. Uh, then you identify the, the elements and allocate value and all that. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on it briefly. So. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, this, from the way you're presenting, it looks like an operational kind of statement in the sense that it's already happened. 
We will exactly. We will talk about it. So let's take a look at this. That's a great point. Uh, we will talk about projections, and uh, you know, Shauna has uh, you know some some slides on projections and financial modeling. But also this one over here, you're absolutely right. So if you look at ACT for this model over here, that's your actuals. So even when you make a projection, uh, you want to update your projections, you go to the board next time with your actuals, actually what happened. And then you'll have a slide to compare actuals with uh, your projections to see what did you go wrong or what did you do do better so you can explain it to them where are you on track of the business and on this part, this particular one you see forecast like august 17 that's a forecasted so that has not really happened so it's the same basis that you'll be doing so now let's talk a little bit about uh, you know i know some of you you discussed about stock based compensation uh, so one of the things that I want to discuss in, 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 in the next slide is uh, gap consideration, right? I know we are a startup for the most part and we want to conserve cash, rightly so, and we don't want to spend money on unnecessary things, right? Uh, unfortunately, as you grow, whether you get into Series C or Series D or maybe you go for uh, debt financing, Lenders might ask you for audited financials. Like one of the clients they recently worked with, uh, it's a startup company, biotech, uh, you know, generally funded by founders and friends and family and some other investors. They didn't get any uh, venture capital involved, but they did go out for uh, debt funding for about 50 million. They did get it. And guess what? They asked for three years of financial statements and they have to go back and audit three years of historical financial statements. That was the requirement, right? So generally, we are too caught up on, you know, we do a good job uh, for expenses and cutoff, etc. Uh, but when it comes to uh, gap, you know, there are certain things that we need to keep in mind, such as uh, stock-based compensation, you issue uh, options to your, to your employees. And uh, guess what? The US gap, the SC is a topic 718 talks about that you need to value that on granted fair value. It's a it's, uh, valuation that you will do and you will recognize that expense over the service term. That is typically, or the vesting term, that's typically the service term, right? So that's, you know, as a startup, you might say that's a non-cash expense, right? I mean, it doesn't really affect me. And your investors might be okay with it, right? But then you get into more sophisticated investors and audited financials, guess what? You have to do it. Uh, that's I would say that for my clients, if they're not in a situation where they need to be audited, which I mean, more often than not, I think with your seed round and your series A and oftentimes even your series B, the audit requirement will be in the documentation, but it'll get waived. Um, and if you don't have to get audited, it actually costs, it costs money to do this calculation. You've got to get in there. You've got to do analysis. And so I would say nine times out of 10, people don't because it's something you can go back and calculate later and you can, you can drop it into historical financial statements and you probably have even better data and it's probably more efficient to do it all at once. Right? Yeah. Well, I would even add that in the early stages, the seed round, you know, uh, preferred A, Round, you can make your best guess estimate as to what the what the the value fair value is of what you've granted. So if you're if you you know if you think that your stock at the early stages is pretty you know like ten cents twenty five cents per common share, then it, the calculation isn't that complex. But as Shauna says, um, to to do it correctly, you actually have to go out and get valuations performed by a, you know a valuation specialist independent special so that that entails a lot more cost but um but she's right once you become audited we'll talk about it later there's a lot of accounting considerations that you have not had to you don't have to spend as much time on or in your early stages but you will and, and so we wanted to highlight those for you so. didn't they make it mandatory now for the when you're raising money to get that valuation by this is, this is different yeah we have it we will walk through that one too yep Sorry. Yeah. Yep. This is this is just your stock based compensation. Four oh nine A will impact your stock based compensation. That's one of the inputs. That that's different. We'll cover that shortly. Yeah. So again, along those lines, uh, there are some U.S. gap consideration. Uh, initially, I struggled with it, and I was calling it as uh, audit consideration. Then I said, no, it's really a U.S. gap consideration. Uh, I didn't want to scare you guys and saying, oh, this is an audit. No, you, you'll be several years away from audit. <laughs> but these are some of the U.S. gap uh, consideration. 
you know, while all of them are important, some of them are more important than the others. Uh, for example, revenue recognition policy. I would not say that we should wait for an audit to happen to develop a revenue recognition policy. The last thing you want to do is a change of, say, one third of your revenue. You can recognize it or derecognize it because you used an incorrect revenue recognition policy. That's something you want to get it right uh, on, on, on day one, right? Uh, capitalized internal use software, I discussed that with you briefly. Uh, yeah, I mean, is it important for you to capitalize? It meets the gap that, you know, again, uh, don't quote me to any of uh, the auditor, the accounting or CPA professionals. I'm a CPA as well. Should not be telling you this, but yeah, it's okay. Uh, you know, if you don't capitalize it again. I never see it. Not, I never see it with startups. Start company, I just right? don't. Uh, SaaS, but it'll be something if you're, if you're a SaaS company, you'll have to deal with it. Uh, and again, stock-based compensation, it's a non-cash expense. So if I, if I go through the, uh, the thing that, the another thing that, that, that strikes to me, and, and Shauna will also add a little bit, is sales and use tax. Uh, in my career, I've seen a lot of companies uh, that somehow miss it and they're about to go public, and guess what? All of a sudden, you investors are asking you to be compliant uh, with uh, all the rules the regulatory agencies and come up with, and there's a millions of dollars of uh, liability there. You have to put it on the books <coughs> for uh, paying to uh, the state. And state and use tax, they get very complex, uh, extremely complex. And I'm not a state, you know, you're not here to talk about state tax, but to make sure that you get in touch with the right expert to uh, assist you with uh, the sales tax. Uh, you know, some of this, the, the uh, states are asking for, uh, uh, if you make a sale of $100,000, right, you've created an excess. So you're supposed to register. Uh, some of the states, you fly down to uh, a, a state and spend two days, guess what? You do trade shows and you start selling. State will uh, ask you, pay your sales tax. Guess what? In some of the states I've told, uh, the, the sales tax people are actually attending trade shows collecting visiting cards. So once you go home, you'll get a letter saying, hey, I just saw you, you visited here. They will look at your website, you're making a sale, have you paid sales tax? So the point is it's important, let's not wait uh, for some of those things uh, to worry about when the audit is done or something. We'll, we'll and and Vishnu's right, the states are getting aggressive, right? There's a lot of states, ours here included, that want to get into your pocketbook. And so the fact that um, you tell them that you didn't know what the rules were, they just laugh at you. They don't care. It's like income taxes, right? So you, you, you want to make sure if you are selling products and you have revenue, know what your rules are. Do not Do not skip that. I would say of this list, Understand revenue recognition for your product. Make sure you have that cold, and um, and pay your taxes. And revenue impacts even valuation of a company. So, but anyways, I will also see if Patty has uh, things to add. Or, let's see. I have a quick question on that. One. So, so, what if what if your it's not a true scale of the end product? It may be a prototype, and your customer is trying it out, but they give you some money. Is that still considered revenue? If I, it meets your revenue recognition. It, you know what, honestly, the, the problem with, with sales and use tax is every single state of all 50 states tends to be unique. And some of them, like New York, are just incredibly aggressive. California is incredibly aggressive. Nevada, not so much. So, I mean, it, that really is a question where it would depend on the fact and circumstances. I mean, it sounds like, like, like in general, I would say, oh, probably, you're probably fine, but... But, you know, you, like, like I said, the problem is you, if you run into a problem and you do it wrong and you get caught, not only do you owe those original fees, you owe taxes and penalties and, and interest on your penalties. And it just can get ugly. Uh, cap table, uh, we'll talk briefly on the cap table. Uh, it's, it's, it's dear to all the investors and as well as, as, as to you. Uh, as, as, as founders. Uh, so cap table is basically uh, nothing but a snapshot of all the investments, equity investments made, made, uh, made by different class of investors, if you may. Uh, for example, common stock, uh, you know, that will be issued to founders and that's where you'll have common stock, that's the, uh, or the founders or the initial executive team, right? So uh, you'll have common stock, uh, the number of shares by each person's name. Uh, then you have Preferred stock. Preferred stock is your professional uh, money that you raise from venture capitalists. 
Uh, as the name implies, it has preference over common. Where do they have preference? In uh, dividends, right? They may have higher dividend. You know, they may command higher dividends. Uh, they have preference over dividend payments. They get dividends first. Uh, they have, in case of a liquidation, they get their money first. Uh, so you know, that's 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 a big thing. So they are ahead of everybody else uh, in the queue, uh, and also within preferred, right? The people who have come the later stages. You know they will demand preference over say series a series b will demand preference over series a so sort of obvious reasons they'll say hey preferred stock owners will say that hey by the way you are the founders you know your company better so you know i'm not i'm taking your risk so you know i would get the preference same thing with b they said hey you know a you have been around for some time so uh, so you know the company better now you're asking me to join in so that's that's me Going options and restricted stock, uh, we can change it. Uh, you know, I mean, companies issue options to employees or consultants, right, uh, for their services. They could also issue restricted stock uh, for their uh, services. Restricted stock will come in various shape, size, and forms. Uh, you know, and obviously options also will will have some some changes. But restricted stock could be restricted awards uh, or restricted purchase where you have to actually pay money. It works more like options. Uh, and warrants are just like options, but typically you will give it not to your employees, but to your partners, right? I mean, your lenders uh, that come to my mind. Uh, yeah. Other than uh, liquidation preference, are there other reasons because of uh, yeah. other Yeah, there, there could be, uh, and I will also have Perry chime in, there could be a redemption, right? Uh, now we're getting into some nuances as to when is it getting uh, redeemed that is convertible when they can convert at what price uh, they can uh, convert like but you know typically like if there is a redemption you know it will act more like a debt uh, then we're getting into accounting nuances uh, accounting nuance will look at preferred stock to see what is the geography of the preferred stock again when you get into the audit world that's one thing the auditors will look at it preferred stock they'll take a look at it okay is it equity is it you know is it a liability classified looking based on the terms or is it uh, mezzanine mezzanine is usually somewhere between equity and liability and that's more for a public company not so much for a private company but private companies are graced to adopt those uh, rules <clears throat> Will be typically. They could be two different classes, uh, you know, and typically they would be, right? Preferred A and preferred B. Uh, they could have different uh, preferences, different terms, depending on how the company is doing, what the investors are looking for. Uh, so yeah, typically it could be different. And then they always are presented. Every series is presented separately. Mm -hmm. So so if that was more your question. Yeah, you'll always have a your balance sheet and your standard equity will always show a series A, you know, issuance, a series B, a series C, and so on. So in, in this, obviously, in things like pre seed or kind of the top some other, they are very good category of what that is. <laughs> And we'll get into the 409A evaluation when you go to the outside funding. Typically, it's a good idea to do a 409A, and uh, Shana will talk a little bit about because that values your common stock and the, you know, the, the fair value of options granted to employees. The only other thing I'll add is that if, at the onset, um, you account for these things kind of as the cash comes in, but once you get closer to being required to uh, be audited or, or um, have some audit, you know, or gap compliant financial statements, this area gets very complex very quickly mm -hmm. from an accounting perspective, not just in the preferred stock classification, yeah. but also if you had, you know, the bridge, you know, uh, convertible debt financing, mm -hmm. the terms often of those convertible debt notes would be, you know, that they get to uh, convert into preferred stock, but at a rate lower, let's say 90% of what mm -hmm. you sell your, you know, your Series A. So that starts to create a benefit to them, and that benefit needs to be accounted for separately. And that's what we prefer to a beneficial conversion feature. So these, this, this area starts to get very complex, and this is one area, 
you know, having been a, a partner in, at Deloitte, like this, with a new client, I always would look, you know, especially a new early stage client that hadn't been audited before, this is an area that I would always look at first. It's just deep. Uh, and the other issue about uh, tax valuation. The valuation, yes. Tax information. Right, right. There's, it just has a whole ripple effect. And then all, often, the other thing I'd recommend for you guys now is definitely track all your option agreements, mm -hmm. restricted stock, more arrangements, because that often becomes difficult. If you don't have the paperwork now, you know, five years from now or six years from now when you're looking at your first audit and you don't have that, you know, we're going to have to make some guesses about things that we really don't want to. We'd rather know. And, and also you may get in trouble even further down the line if, if someone believes that they have a right to your equity mm -hmm. and you don't have it on your records or your you know your legal counsel doesn't have it on their rec you know in their records either so someone can sue you at a very late stage of the company let's say even like you know pre-ipo there could be some you know legal noise and you don't you don't want to do you know avoid you want to avoid that at all costs so i would say definitely what i have seen in my experience a lot of these arrangements don't get enough documentation. Mm -hmm. And I would just say to you, document them and keep those records. Yeah, I would say a best practice is to set up some sort of electronic data room right mm -hmm. from the get-go. And with equity, it could be a software package like eShares. It could be Dropbox. It could be Box. It could be whatever you want it to be. It could be your attorney's website. Maybe you feel that's more secure. But um, if you assume that at some point you're going to have a liquidity event, which is probably why you're doing this, either an M&A transaction or an IPO, just store it all there. You're going to need it. You're going to need it for due diligence. Take the time from day one to properly organize it and categorize it and store it electronically where sometime later in the future you can give access to the people that need it. It will save you such heartache and headaches. Uh, uh, It's a, it's a, it's an additional, basically, it's an additional, um, uh, it's an additional element of your equity. It's called beneficial conversion feature. So it's basically an embedded gain that these people have, right? Because they're able to buy in to preferred stock at ninety percent price versus a hundred percent, or convert right. in, and so that uh, beneficial conversion is going to shock. You know, you if you're not aware of that concept, because it's going to come in as like a big uh, charge through your uh, mm -hmm. through your equity okay. statement. Yeah. Is it the discount that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the ten percent discount off or whatever. You know, usually I see it around ten percent. Because you're they're getting it at a lower price than yeah. the value. Yeah. Value, yeah. I think we have a, we have a question back there. He's okay. Yes. 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 Absolutely. You see that all the time, and and what it is, you have to call it out. Like it has to be called convertible preferred stock by your financial statements, and if it's redeemable, the title is redeemable convertible preferred stock. Do the terms of the conversion have to be uh, agreed to as well? Do they have to be agreed to? Do they have to be agreed to before the actual event happens? Yes. Yes. Because that's yes. typically written into the uh, the issuance. Yeah, in the agreements before there you you actually issue the, the stock. If if the terms are not known, it will has different accounting consequences. It may not we be have... known, like the actual rate at yeah. which they convert may not be known, but you have to define it. Like if it's a future based on a future event, like you'll convert at the next series, you know, next preferred round. That's enough to define it. You may not know the actual dollar rate that it exchanges at, but you have to define what, what, how it will be triggered. And and typically all the preferred stocks that that we have seen, typically all of them get converted on an, an IPO event or or an exit. I mean, rarely will they carry on as a preferred stock because that's a liquidity event. Uh, that has happened for them to feel comfortable. Yeah, they could be common stockholders. Typically, we have everything a question right here too. So my question is, uh, what is the kind of So all of your equity agreements 
And if you do a preferred round, there's a, you know, a, a stack of 10 different agreements that will come with it. So executed copies, that's important too. Make sure that you keep those signatures because sometimes you have earlier copies, but you need the executed copies. Your um, operating agreement, your charters, your, you know, the, if you're a Delaware corporation, the Secretary of State will give you stamp documents, all that kind of stuff. And you your need, articles of incorporation. If you add to this, you will need all of those documents when you go through your first audit. Auditors are going to ask you, so you need to, need to have it, not only for the accuracy, but even for them to audit, uh, to be able to audit that. And, and any documented board minutes? Yes. Minutes of board meetings? Okay. Yeah. yeah, good point, Patty. Yes. Yes. I mean, but the, yeah, yes for, for money, right? So yes, they are very happy to help you with that and to give you a bill for that $400 an hour paralegal. So yeah, I mean, the more you can do yourself to control it and to control your access, the, the less you spend. Yeah, we had a question. So at a large liquidity event, let's say the company raised $20 million and got acquired for $400 million, yeah. a very large multiple, generally do, is it a one-to-one -one conversion of preferred to common or... Would that be in the terms that you could say that what preferred stock will get converted to five pounds? That will be in the terms of your preferred stock, yeah. But what is typical? At, at That's the beginning, you always see one. one for one. one for yeah. One. Yeah, you yeah. can see that. Uh, and then it'll define other situations. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Should we move on? Oh, one, oh, one more? Yeah. Okay, so sorry. When, when you're, let's say for your bootstrapping, you. Use yeah. Uh, consultants to do the, you know, and, and they're are only working part time. They're are only working on their own, uh, you know, their own equipment and all that, right? Yep. Um, it, let's say you get a, uh, you value the amount of work that, that they that you're having them do. Yep. Put a cost value on it, and then give them a convertible note on that, right? With the discount and uh, uh, and the right to be able to, you know, either just pay it out or that. Is there any way you can get in, um, any kind of uh, problems doing that? I, I, a problem? A yeah. No, I mean, you just want to record it. You yeah. just, it's a liability of your company. And as right. long as, as long as you document it and you record it, I, I can't think of a problem. No. But there's no, uh, there's no way they could come back because you have a legal agreement. Uh, you know, as long as it's signed and executed, right? Then you have an agreement saying that they, uh, the, the work was valued at this money dollars at this much rate. And then, uh, but is there, um, is there anything like that? they have to have representation or anything like that if they're an independent consultant? Like they need an attorney in order to sign the agreement. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe that's a best practice where you say, "Hey, take this to your attorney." And and certainly in this country, no matter what you sign and no matter what you agree to, there's always the risk that someone comes back later and says, "Oh, I, my work wasn't worth a thousand dollars. Now that you're a billion dollar company, my work was worth a million dollars." I mean, you had your best to make to try to ensure. But something like that doesn't happen. You, I, I would utilize the um, services of an attorney to draft the agreement on your side, right? And make sure that um, that that you know a professional has vetted it, and there's nothing weird in the agreement. Yeah. So as long as it's a you know straight state of the art, agreement. straight of the art. That's the best yeah. you can do. Yeah. But there's not there's nothing from the uh, the governmental practices perspective or that that could could bite you later for uh, for essentially what you're doing is you're giving a promissory note for work done. Right. I, don't, I mean, there's nothing that comes the, to mind for me, the Patty. The example you? that comes to my mind that, that, that might be a problematic if it's you've given it to your founder or related party, right? Uh, that's something when you get into the audit process, uh, you go to a liquidity event, typically they will be asked to pay, get paid back. But not okay? not, typically it should not be, but it should be just, you know, make sure that it's, it's very well laid in. Uh, and even when, before you go through a liquidity event, you, you're aware of it, right? So, Maybe it gets converted prior to that, right? So you don't let that hanging, and then it that's a good gets, point. Gets yeah. into the clean it up. Of, you know, due diligence and people will constantly ask you questions. Uh, what is it? And they will ask them. They will get into it. But just, if, just just make sure it's paid off. Fast we're done. Forward. Yeah, and any any of the related party transaction, that's a different uh, topic. If you're uh, if there's a founder. And instead of salary, they'll say, okay, I have seen some examples. Uh, uh, they'll say, okay, I will get paid in convertible note. And I have the option, either I get paid in debt or I have the option to convert it. Yeah, you will go through the, the audit. It's a lot of headaches. Uh, board will force either him to convert or to, to pay it up, to give it to pain. And in any due diligence, it will go through a lot of scrutiny. So it's not even worth the headache. So. But I, 
an attorney will protect you there because yeah. they will set up the parameters where it's certain events will require it yeah. to be you know, converted. converted or paid off. Okay. Like an IPA event, right? Automatically converted. So. All right, here we go. So we've had a lot of fanfare going into this topic. So this is the topic that um, that relates to um, how you value your stock options, your employee stock options. So about uh, 13 years ago in October 2004, just as this valley was blowing up with stock option backdating scandals, um, the IRS passed a new requirement that says that you cannot, companies for a long time would just arbitrarily decide, you know what, I want all my employees to be rich and so we're going to say all these stock options are worth a penny. You can no longer do that. You can't decide as a founder and as an entrepreneur what your common stock is worth and what your option strike price should be. You have to go hire a valuation firm and have a reputable third party do an analysis. They typically use three or four prescribed standard methods, including uh, Black-Scholes analysis and a variety of different analysis. And um, they will they will take a look at your preferred rounds and what the valuation of that is and all the data. And then they will tell you what your common stock can be priced at. Yep. It really was. <laughs> it really was back in the day. It was. It was pretty wild. Um, the thing with 409A, where I think it really bites hard, is that um, if in fact there's an error or there's a mistake and there's a problem or you don't do it right, the person that gets hurt is the employee, right? And the tax consequences and the various consequences can be enormous. And it's not the corporation that runs into the problem as, as much as the employee. So this is an area where I would say like, I have, I've had a bazillion startups that I've helped since I joined um, Kranz and Associates four years ago. And this is one where no one takes this lightly. People pay the money and they do the work and they pay attention to this one. Can you go on to the next slide? Um, and so I think it's really important um, to make sure you, you can pay a variety of prices for this. And a lot of times, like Silicon Valley Bank just recently sold their valuation practice. But up until recently, they would be doing a very good, high quality valuation for startups where they wanted to get the banking relationship for free. And um, as a as a seed series company or a series A company, you can get a pretty good price on these. You can pay twenty five hundred dollars, thirty five hundred dollars. Whereas in two thousand and four, it was like ten to fifteen thousand dollars across the board because there just wasn't the competition. But the very important thing to remember is you get what you pay for. And when you're um, interviewing firms to do this work for you, make sure that they're reputable, that you get a referral and that they have experience with auditors. Make sure that the work that they do stands up to the big four and that the firm that you hire will support you when you are audited if issues come up because this is an area where issues come up. So, so I mean, you, you get what you pay for here. And what I'm seeing these days, the trend is as you move farther along in your sophistication and your um, rounds of financing, the price goes up. And that makes sense, right? There's more risk. There's there's just more things going on. And so it gets more and more and more expensive. Um, I guess the other thing to mention is the timing. And so you want to do this every time something happens in your, your company's life that has caused the valuation of your enterprise to change, like any kinds of rounds of financing or debt, you want to go get one of these. But kind of the safe harbor rule is you want to get it at least once a year. And and companies really do do that. And um, if you, for some reason, are in the middle of a financing transaction, and all of a sudden it's taking you longer than you thought, and your 409A is now 18 months old, it's not 12 months old, don't issue options. Wait. Wait until you have this, and then issue the options with the strike price from your 409A. Don't issue options during that six month time period with the old price. Yep. No, in terms of like, like you get a result and you think it's higher than it should be. I don't see that. 
the fire with the steam. Either you see the story at the early stages of evolution are higher than they actually end up being, or is there, are they lower? Um, you, you might have a valuation for the enterprise that's higher than maybe what you think, but typically for the common stock, they, they, uh, yeah, the, the enterprise valuation is, is, is different. So this is literally, okay, here's the enterprise valuation. Let's take a look at the components of equity and let's value the common stock. And the common stock is illiquid as a startup and you know, what are you gonna, who are you gonna sell it to? So there's all these discount factors that go into play. So I would say the firms that I normally work with, the valuations for the common stock come back pretty reasonable. And in situations where they don't, then you sit down with the valuation firm and you, um, you have a discussion and you say, look, we have risk A, B, C, D, E, and I think that you're overvaluing this. I think the strike price should be 10 cents and you got it at a dollar. And, and I've, I've always had a, protect, a very productive conversation in that scenario. And, um, and, and I'd say every single time I've had to have that conversation, we've gone back and taken a look at the math and, um, and the prices ended up lower. They trend together, but the value of your enterprise could be $5 million at that point in time. And you've got to figure out, you've got some preferred stock, you've got some common stock, you've got warrants, you've got all these things. What is the value of the common stock piece? So it's, it's not just, you know, if, if common stock were 25% of your equity, the valuation of the common stock is not the valuation of the company divided by 25%. It's, it's, it's more nuanced. Let's say you're not an advanced mature stage company. Uh, so what is the best practice in terms of stock options for, uh, I mean, you have founders that are separate. Yep. Between that and say, putting the former run, let's say you have three waves of uh, employees or have options issues. Yeah. What is the best practice that you recommend? Well, I mean, in you... Terms of the price of the Get a 409A and get it every year and issue the options at the strike price from the 409A is what I'd, I'd recommend. Don't let it get stale. But I mean, you're going to, to attract top talent, you're going to probably want to give people stock options. And so bring them in, grant them on a very timely basis. Don't, don't delay the paperwork unnecessarily. And the strike price for those options just comes straight off your 409A. So it's really straightforward. Yeah. So I guess it's your question, do you really need a 409A? Yes. To be honest, and I'm, I'm talking now about it from an audit partner perspective, uh, I didn't spend a lot of time ever auditing like seed options, seed value options, you know, seed round options, because the value was just typically pretty low, right? So the materiality, it wasn't until I had the first preferred stock round that I started to really look at that the options that were issued or granted around that day. So, um, you know, it's a matter of judgment. Sean is saying best practice is probably to get a 409A to the extent you can get them for a minimal cost. Practically, I'm saying that you, you know, you have a lot more flexibility in the earlier the seed round, you know, or, you know, seed time options. Especially if it's a friends and family round. Yeah. I mean, it, if it's a friends and family round and it's not with professional investors, I think that's a fact and circumstance that kind of changes it too. But I mean, by the time you get to a, a series A, um, then yeah. play by the rules. <laughs> and, and to, so let's say you have a series A in so 18 months from when you started. Yep. And let's say it is, you know, two rounds, to six months, 12 months. So, so what, what is the, I mean, any, and you don't do a four or nine, so are, are there sort of ballpark? Uh, typically, you said it as one year subscription. Typically, you said it as one year subscription. Yeah, that's 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 like the, the the rule of thumb that people used to use before. Uh, I don't see it that often, but 409A is to do more to do with the tax consequences to your employees. Uh, to answer your question, if you have from your seat to maybe 18 months. Uh, it's recommended to do a 409A, but if you have a major change in circumstances that would warrant 
the value of your stock has gone up. It's highly recommended. Maybe you got a customer uh, $2 million. Yeah, that's changed the value of your company. So you don't want to be offering uh, the options at a seed round common stock value. That is going to raise attention and that could go, uh, pose tax consequences to uh, your employee. So if you have a major change that has occurred, absolutely get it done. It's a few hundred dollars. Uh, you know, I've seen uh, even lower, but none of the companies that I've, I've come across with, they would at least do it annually. But if they have a change in circumstance financing or a major event that has happened, they would get the 409A done because it's, it's just worth getting it done. If there's no change, uh, you still have zero to 18 months, you still have half a dozen employees, you've gotten one employee, you're still doing R&D, you've not made significant development, yeah, maybe can you justify it? Yeah, maybe you can, as long as you have supporting documents in case of an IRS audit or something, not that I've seen any IRS audits uh, in, in this matter, uh, yeah, if you can justify that, they will come and ask you, justify it, yeah, you can justify it. Do the typical corporate investors do their own in-house valuation or do they go externally to valuation you want a third party uh, to be done uh, some, some corporate investors have the you know people who are valuation specialists internally they can do them I had one client who, who did um, but most of my clients go outside to third parties because it's a independence issue from an audit perspective so that's the reason you get a third party and practically all the time uh, to Shauna's point, uh, auditors are going to challenge who are valuation specialists. Is. Do they know what they're doing? Uh, and of course, they will also evaluate the independence rule. Are they independent of the management of the company? Your typical, your typical corporate lawyer cannot do the valuation. They do not. They, that would be a con yeah, that would be a conflict of interest. I, I actually, I don't, I don't know of any lawyers that do valuation. No. Yeah, a valuation firm. There's a valuation we don't firm. do it. We definitely don't do it. Is there's a there is a, I mean this is since since two thousand and four this is like the um, equal opportunity employment act for people that want to be actuaries at a college, right? So there are lots of firms, lots of specialty firms where this is all they do all day long. So yep. Yeah, the triggers, and I will also have Shama jump in, but triggers generally would be is you're issuing stock options to your uh, employees. That's where it becomes important because you're giving them options in lieu of services, and uh, the IRS wants to make sure they're giving it to them at fair value and not below the price, and like she pointed out, of, of backdating options, uh, which actually happened in, in, in yesteryears. Uh, so that, that will be a trigger when you should get it done. So you certainly have to have, if you're not issuing any stock options, there's no need for a 409 evaluation to be done. Uh, the triggers uh, would be change in circumstances, change in uh, major financing transactions that you should get it done. Uh, but like Safe Harbor is uh, at least at least once a year. Uh, make, and but by the way, as you come very close to a financing transaction, maybe an IPO as well, almost certainly you will see not not uh, very back into the future, but companies will start doing quarterly evaluation because then they are giving, uh, and that's when it will come into SEC scrutiny, they will ask a lot of questions on the evaluation. So companies want to make sure they're giving uh, quarterly evaluation uh, to do so. Initially seed round and all, yeah, if you can justify once a year, that's okay. Okay, we have one last question, then we'll move on. So, uh, with 401, 409A, um, you know, when you're doing the first time, Low, what I've heard in yeah, oh yeah, you you always wanted to be low. <laughs> yeah. But then for, for, for an exit type transaction, you wanted to be as high as possible. Well, not necessarily not your necessarily. your common stock price, right? I mean, I would say, as an employee, I always wanted to be low. Yeah, yeah. You, the valuation of your enterprise is separate, right? So you want the valuation of the company to be as high as, as possible, but you want the valuation of your common stock to to you know to be low they yeah. are separate yeah and it's a it's a fine line right yeah. so employees would want to get, you know the value to be low as but however the older employees would want to see a rise in the value right they say hey I've got an option I was an initial person 
So they would like to see a rise, but the next employer that comes in, they'd also want it low. So it's, it's, it's a fine line, and that's the reason valuation experts come into to play, to make sure they're using the right model. There are various models uh, available uh, to do, and to make sure that they're using the right one uh, for the company in this stage of development. What's the couple between the uh, common valuation and the company valuation? Can I just answer that? Like, yeah. The enterprise valuation is obviously company valuation. Mm -hmm. What the 409A, this valuation specialist is, they take that enterprise value, they perform what they refer to as an option pricing methodology, an OPM model. They apply that and they kind of say, how do I take the enterprise value and allocate it to all the equity ownership that exists in the company, fully diluted, including all options outstanding, all you know, warrants outstanding, restricted stock. Mm -hmm. And from that allocation, and it takes into account, for instance, liquidation preferences, uh, if you've got preferred A or B. And so they do that uh, based on their analysis. And then whatever slice of the pie is allocated to the common stock. So they have to slice the pie, and one of those slices is to common stock value. And, and that's why we're saying they move together, as we mentioned, you know, as your enterprise value gets higher, presuming that there's not additional dilution of your equity with another round of preferred, then yes, the, they move together. But if you've got another big preferred round, then your comment, everyone gets diluted more, so maybe the value per unit comes down. So there's, it's, it's, it's definitely, an, you know, analytics, right? It's valuation theory. And they go through a process to say, your enterprise value, there's various models that build into how do we determine your enterprise value. We can determine it based on comparable com public companies, comparable to you. We can determine it based on um, a what they call the backs off method, which is if you've had a recent preferred stock financing, they'll use that value that external third parties bought into for preferred, and they'll use that value to create um, an assumption, you know, the value of your enterprise value. Kind of build it up that way. We that's kind of that's that's kind of the gold standard, right? That's mm -hmm. the best. Yeah. That's the best valuation yeah. is what yeah. a independent third party just paid mm -hmm. to invest. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's the best time to get a valuation because you have a nice line in the sand. Right. So that, that's kind of what I'm saying. It's like the enterprise value is the big pie, and the common stock value is just the small slice of it. Right. Because it, the pie is the sum of all your equity. But it's it's a catch twenty two because what we're you know. If we're trying to game the system, right, and we want to try to get the, the value of the company as high as possible before we mm -hmm. take equity investment, right, right, then it's like you want to try to understand what the metrics are for for increasing the valuation. What you're saying is all the the, the what the, they're willing to pay is the valuation. Yeah. So how do you increase what they're willing to pay? Just negotiation. Yeah, and it is just what it is, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the having a, a large enterprise value and having the company be valuable is in the best interest of all the shareholders, right? So the fact that maybe their common shares aren't super cheap is, you know, too bad, so sad, because it's part of a greater good, right? I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't really game this anymore. Back in the day, you could game this. So what, I, what I mean is that, uh, you know, it's all about justification when you're negotiating this, you know, you're selling a chunk of the company, and you're negotiating mm -hmm. what, what yeah. it should be worth, right? Yep. So if you're going to be dealing with their attorneys and the accountants and whatnot, and, you have to and, be yeah. able to justify it. And I'm sure yeah. they'll have their own yeah. valuation specialist, right? right? right. So, so, mm -hmm. so you guys have to come to a, a meeting of mind. You'll have, you kind of will present what you think, or you think, you'll go in thinking, hey, I think my company's worth five million. They're thinking, well, no, it's probably worth four, so we don't want to pay as much. Or, you know, it could be the other way around. But, so but the, there, are, there should be some uh, things you can do, like little, uh, you know, say, okay, uh, negotiation tricks, saying, okay, uh, uh, comparables are obviously one, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's good uh, data. You know, how much revenue you have, and, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know yeah. multiple you revenue, goals, yeah. Right? yeah. Right, and then uh, future earnings potential, right? Absolutely. So, so like, are there any others that I, I haven't, you know, mentioned? No, I think you've hit that. You, you just did, yeah, discounted yeah. cash flow. I mean, no, you, you got it. It, early, early stage companies have the discounted cash flow model that you said, like what you project for your future earnings. Mm -hmm. That one's a little bit harder to hang yeah. your hat on because you don't have a um, historical, you know, activity that validates. So you can do it based off of other, you know, comparable companies. Right. What they that, that's and called that, the, yeah, yeah. That's a separate. One. I'm yeah. talking about discounted cash flow model for your own yeah. forecast uh, I see, I see. versus comparable companies for sure. I think the early stage companies typically, when you're dealing with valuation experts, it's it's comparable company method plus um, 
that's all if you've got a, more, a recent financing yeah. event, and then they just weight them. They say, well, which of the, you know, like, do we weight them 50-50, 70-30, 60-40? I've also heard that, you know, in some cases, if you actually have one of these things. It's, 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 it's an art. It's 100% an art. If you actually have a revenue, like, so you're actually up in operation, and you're selling stuff, you can actually get zinc for it because, uh, you know, then they'll do a 3x revenue or a 5x revenue as opposed to, yeah. As opposed to valuing you before you have revenue on your on your potential revenue, exactly. Yeah, there is a there is a point in time where where the curve does this and then does that again, for sure, yeah. for sure. I like that right here. We said it's an art pretending to be science. Yes, agreed. <laughs> and and what? at a high level, the board, a lot of investors, this is a hot button with them because if you issue cheap stock, the company really goes up in value. Then they start getting Cheap stock can lead to the underwithheld, the IRS comes after you, the company's liable. There's a lot of things that can happen. Not so much early on. And so really this valuation report is a guide for the board to value the company. They don't have to use it, but they usually do. And so it's you know, if you want to drive up the valuation of your company by like what you do every day, but this is just sort of an exercise that goes through. And they do compare to, you know, comparable, I, you know, companies that have gone IPO in this space, or there's different methodologies, as you're saying. But it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's got a purpose. And so, you, you know, you want to stay within those bounds. I mean, if you have a preferred stock round, usually the common stock is, what, 20% to 30% of the price of the preferred round. I mean, it's not 5%, it's not even. Right, usually. right. So, Right, exactly. It's all within. It has a purpose. It's not just a... Well, clearly we hit a um, hot topic, and thank you for jumping in, Mike. So let's let's move on. Okay, business modeling and forecasting. All right, I will go through this um, kind of quickly, I think. Um, so why do you create a business model? You're an entrepreneur. You um, are going to go set up a new company. Why do you create a, a business model? Well, um, potential investors want to see how much revenue and how profitable this, this line of business is going to be that you're planning to get into. And they also want to get a sense of the level of expenses that are going to be required in order to generate that revenue or to get to a specific milestone that's a goal. Um, and so you want to put together you want to put together a good plan. And what I would say is, um, investors are savvy, right? And so unless you are working in some space that's completely brand new, um, they typically, at least the last bunch of years, I would say almost all the VC firms have um, a specific core competency and they have a focus area. And a lot of them won't go outside of their focus area. And so they're talking to lots of people in that area. So when you show up and you're looking for money, you want to make sure that you've talked to advisors that know that space and know the metrics in that space and the key performance indicators. And you want to go in with, with really good data on, you know, here's my fa financial forecast and this is growth projections and this is how it's going to look. You want to make sure that you know what you're, you're doing. Um, and um, when you ask for more cash later on, you want to make sure that you put together a business model that was achievable, right? So you go in, you say, give me $2 million and I'm going to get to this milestone in 18 months. You want to try to stick to that, right? You want to get to that milestone. You want to get there in $2 million. You want to get there in 18 months. Next page. Um, so what, what would you typically do? How would you typically put together a model? I think um, more often than not, people will put together a three to a five year model. And um, depending on the nature of your business, if you're really able to to forecast details, maybe you do the first two years as a bottoms up model where you've baked out all kinds of details. What are you buying? Who are you hiring? Who are your customers? What's the pricing? And then maybe the last couple of years is more of a tops down model where you say, okay, a public company proxy in this industry has these types of, you know, R&D as a percentage of revenue. And I think by year five, I'm going to kind of be closer to that track. So you build that out more of a tops down. But I would say um, a lot of entrepreneurs just put together on their own an income statement. 
but you really want to tie a whole comprehensive plan together where you have an income statement, a balance sheet, a cash flow, your CapEx, your capital expenditure plan, your OpEx plan. You want to know what you're going to spend on departments, so R&D, sales and marketing, G&A, but you want to know what you're going to spend on functional areas like salaries, benefits, um, you know, the, the building lease. The next slide, please. Um, so you you definitely want to understand who are you selling to? Who are my target customers? What is the pricing? What are they willing to buy this from me for? What is this going to cost me? What is the cost to acquire a customer? It's amazing how expensive that can be and how people will underestimate um, what it costs to acquire a brand new customer. And you want to you want to understand proxies if there's any data available for similar companies. You want to know. Know, what sales channel do I need? Do I need to go hire a sales team of VP of sales and a plethora of coin operated people who are going to go sell this and travel all over the world and cost me a fortune? Or for what I do, is there a really good um, channel partner that already has distribution set up that I could partner with to get to market quicker? Um, you see that sometimes with medical devices, right? There, uh, maybe there's a distribution um, partner already in all the hospitals that you want to go target. And so you can sell faster if you partner. Um, what people do you need to achieve your key milestones? And can you hire them on a temp basis or, um, you know, until your model's proven? Or do you have to hire them as employees? What are you going to have to pay them? And that is now readily available data. You can either hire a consulting firm um, that specializes in compensation to go give you compensation information or just go to Glassdoor, right, and do a bunch of your own research and figure out what, what do these positions cost and where are you going to put these people? Are they going to be offshore or are they going to be in the Silicon Valley? Are they going to be in Palo Alto? Because that's, that's totally different. Um, and then what's the timing? And I, the thing that I would say to you is, based on my experience, if you don't have a person in your pipeline that you already know that you're planning to hire, assume 90 days, right, to source resumes, go through the process, bring people into interview, get your team to vet, and then negotiate with, with that candidate and maybe lose them. Um, assume, assume it takes a good three months in order to bring people in the door as you're building your plan. And then, you know, what technology do you need to purchase? What tools do you need? Can you lease them? Can you get someone else to use their cash to buy it for you and give it to you only as needed? Um, I think what, what I would give as advice is when you're a startup and you're trying to be nimble and um, I mean, cash is always king, I think it's really wise to try to keep your expenses as variable as possible. So instead of like committing to a whole bunch of fixed expenses that can be a problem for you later, especially as it relates to people, because getting rid of people is very expensive. It's great if you can if you can characterize your expenses to be super variable, even if it's slightly more expensive then you're nimble. You may think you need team X, Y, Z, and then you realize that actually you're pivoting and you're headed in a whole new direction. And it's really nice to be able to get rid of team X, Y, Z and go in your other direction. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so I've kind of covered this. I would say just know what's most important to you. Know what's most expensive for your business. Use realistic estimates. And here in the Valley, it's going to be your people, right? It's going to be the cost associated with the people. So if you can nail that down, you're in good shape. Um, and for sure, do what you can do to get data. If there is a good public company proxy, Go to the internet and pull their financial statements. And if you don't know how to read them, go, you know, get someone who can help you. But go figure out what, <laughs> I mean, as boring as that might seem, go read those financial statements and figure out what they're spending on all of these cost categories as a percentage of their revenue. Because, because that's probably ultimately your target someday. And, you know, the investors will certainly look to any proxies to justify what you're saying in your projections. Next slide. Let me just go through this. And don't forget 
It's, you know, this this was an actual company. And, I mean, the model was unbelievable. Look at all those levels of detail, right? And who cares? 50% of the spending was on salaries. And you can see there's another couple other big buckets too. So don't make a crazy, super detailed, super hard to manage model. Go figure out just the five most important things and focus on that. You had a question? Yeah, I think you were mentioning Yep. For sure. So for sure. Yeah, I'm saying that's more for the you know the the yeah. fifth year, yeah. right? That's the data that you want to know that data, but it's it's not that's not going to be your your story. The earlier slide that we showed of the company's um, profitability by, by quarter, that's a forecast model I'm working on right now with a client, and you can see in the near term quarter they're losing money. Their gross margin was essentially zero, right? And then, oh, miraculously by Q4, they're gonna drop 35% to the bottom line, hooray. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's that kind of a thing. There's only a couple of things I would want to add is uh, uh, just based on my experience in working with some of the founders on, in, in, in modeling uh, some of the companies. Uh, first is uh, do not underestimate the importance of a mathematical check. Uh, it's extremely important to take a look at the model. Uh, you may get too entangled into the big picture you've forgotten uh, to look at the uh, the models. Make sure that it ties, it works, it works in common sense. Uh, secondly, I know as, as, as founders, we are all very optimist uh, and we want to be very aggressive in terms of our projection. When you're making a modeling, making a projections, I would highly encourage uh, you to get a couple of other of your executive team member, one is who is a realist and one who is a pessimist, uh, who can debate, all three of you can debate and come to the, the right number. I cannot tell you how many times I've taken a look at the, the, the model. Trust me, 95% of the time you missed it by a big number. Small number is okay, but you missed it by a big number. And that talks about the credibility. You want to build credibility with your investors. You know, obviously, who cares about five years? Everybody is going to miss it. Even a public company is going to miss it. But at least you want your business plan. You're sticking to the business plan. Like Shana said, you want to stick to it. And of course, you get your forecast for the next 12 months, 18 months, correct, reasonably correct. Right? But if you are going to say that I'm going to do a $20 million revenue and you do 500000 that's a big problem. Uh, so that's the reason I said, Get two other of your folks in the room, one who's a pessimist, one who's a realist, you're an optimist, go ahead on ahead and say, what is the right number? Question? So from a, from a forecasting and projection point of view, I'm kind of in the middle of it right now. How do you create a model where if something um, relatively new where there is no sort of way to look at Well, on the so on the expense side, it's pretty easy, right? It's pretty easy to say here's the people that I need. So it's really it comes down to modeling the revenue and the pricing mm -hmm. and and um, and that's just trying to get data, right? That's that's meeting with customers and or or anyone who can get you data onto what your pricing is likely to be, what what a deal structure looks like, the length of time of a deal, and then um, I would say what I see is people forecast and reforecast and reforecast as they get better data, right? So you come up with your original premise and um, these are all, in the startup world, these are all done in Excel, right? So this is this is an Excel world. So you, you put together 
you put together the model using the best data available to you, and then you do everything you can to go get data to prove what your you know assumptions, and 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 then you reforecast. Just to add to that uh, point, and sometimes if you're you're creating a company where there is not really a benchmark in terms of revenue, uh, you could use it as an analogy, right? I mean, uh, there are companies if you're in social media, you know, okay, fine, you can use it as an analogy, Facebook or Twitter or whatever that is. Uh, or if you're in a software, you get into a few other companies, depending on what size, there are tons of information available. You don't have to necessarily go for Google or something. There could be other companies in the industry. Uh, there are many uh, data available uh, that you can use it as a benchmark. You can get into a public company and try to be a little bit creative and say why you're different. I know we are running out of time, I, uh, but go ahead. Uh, I yeah. really yeah. That, that's right. It's yeah, always yeah, good yeah. data, right? right. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's really good data. Not, nowadays, there's tons of data also that's available, so you could get. Yeah. Um, here's a, just a question: What's the difference between a model, a, a forecast, and a budget? Nothing. Nothing. You're modeling, you're forecasting, you're budgeting. Budgeting, um, I don't even see that in this valley, right? That's where I've put together my forecast model and I'm going to try to lock it and load it for some period of time and maybe give some managers some autonomy and say, here's a budget, you can go spend up to this amount. But you never even really see that because things change so dynamically. I mean, yes, in big companies, but not in startups. So you don't you don't oftentimes see people say, here's, here's your budget, go spend whatever you want, right? You still are like iterating on decisions. Um, so I think all these words are synonyms. Um, and then big companies do this too, right? So a, a big public company has a forecast model. They're using it in their earnings call. That's where they're giving you their guidance. They're putting it together. Sometimes it's even still in Excel. And, um, and even when you're not a startup, companies are using this to figure out who should I hire? What should I do? Where do I invest? What's my ROI for these different paths? And and then I'd say the, the last point I'll make is the most important thing is if you have a good model and it's tied to a balance sheet, it's going to predict your cash. And you want to know well in advance when your company is going to need to, to raise more cash. Because Again, it's one of those things where that cycle can take a long time. It can take it can take nine months. It can happen really quickly. I've seen that, but but you probably want to assume that it's going to take some substantial effort and some period of time, and you want to be in the best, strongest negotiating position possible. So you don't want to be showing up out of cash, or you're certainly not going to be able to negotiate very effectively. So you want to know that that date is 12 months away, and you want to be working today to put together the plan to get that cash well in advance of no payroll. Historically, over time, like if, how many hours does it take to really put together a baseline model? 40. Mm -hmm. I'd say on average. I do it all the time. I spent 12 hours on one yesterday because the board needs it done before um, the end of December. And typically you'll see that, I'd say, in, um, in many preferred stock agreements, one of the requirements is that you put together a um, forecast model or a budget for at least the next year, and you pre present it to your board oftentimes in December if you're a calendar year end. And um, so that's all and pretty just common. Like and 40 hours would be a model that is very simplistic. But if you try to make it extremely complex, uh, uh, your model in uh, revenue, various years, et cetera, that could get really complex. It could take time. So that's the reason you're saying that keep it simple, that it's easy to understand, easy to manage, uh, easy to explain to people. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can go crazy with what if analysis, right? Yeah. And we're doing that right now for a client of mine. So what if we charge this? What if we rent it? Sure. And it's you know very different. We sell the product up front and bring in all the cash versus we do these three-year rental agreements. Well, then all that revenue is going to be recognized over three years. And although it's not really all that different, the economics of the numbers are very different and the valuation of the company is very different. Is there the valuation be higher if it's leased as opposed to sold? Um, so... Uh, Depending on who you talk to, I mean, SaaS business models tend to lead to lovely valuations because they're predictable, and um, and you know if you have a SaaS business model with a lot of with low churn, 
there will be um, people who tell you that you could get valued at 10x forward revenue. I mean, maybe it's five, it, it, you know, it depends on macro economic circumstances, but certainly I would say in today's world, a hardware company isn't getting valued on 10x revenue. Mm -hmm. They're just not. Yeah. Don't you have some specialized software which can help with it? Putting together models, forecast models? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a number of packages. I just don't personally have um, any clients that use them. It's that that <laughs> yeah yeah. It's an expense. It's an expense to to go implement them, and they're um, in some cases less flexible. So I know like with the with the founders that I'm working with they will pivot on a dime and you know all of a sudden have a new great idea and in a day they want to see what what that looks like to their future results and so excel excel enables you to do that right well, that might be true very few SaaS companies will actually make money absolutely in this right so this is a little bit of a contradiction there value they're, yeah, they're valued high, and yeah, look at Salesforce. Yeah. This we don't need to talk about. It's just a, you know, here's a model on iteration on how to put this. And then, um, yeah. Or, yeah, we, we are running actually out of time. Uh, happy to talk about revenue one on one, but it's almost about time. I know Shauna also has to, to run. And this is a very complex topic. It just just a very brief overview. I know we are getting into new standards, ASC 606. Uh, practically all of you will have to adopt uh, ASC 606. Uh, that's between January 1, 2009. It's, it's uh, 2019. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very complex topic, uh, but we are running out of time. Happy to talk to people who would be interested, but uh, if you guys have any questions, otherwise I just wanted to take a couple of minutes uh, uh, to introduce you uh, to, to grants. Uh, we didn't get that introduction. Actually, we do have a couple of slides at, at the bottom. But uh, Krantz, you know, we are a financial accounting services firm uh, that was formed in 1995. Uh, we, we, we have worked with almost 750, 800 uh, companies since, since inception. About 50 plus uh, VC uh, firms use us as their uh, accounting uh, team. And uh, of the companies that we have worked with, 200 plus have been acquired. In 1718, that we have assisted with uh, their IPO process. A number of them have gone IPO, but the companies that we have assisted with, uh, the and typically we work as a team, uh, headed by a CFO, and, uh, and and of course we have the other accounting staff, uh, that's accounting manager, so that uh, we are giving value at the right level. Transaction services is is being handled by accountants and higher level work with uh, with uh, like CFO. So just as a brief uh, introduction. Yeah, this slide just tells you about our approach, uh, some of the clients that we have worked with. And of course, we also assist with, uh, uh, you know, uh, NetSuite implementation, our company does as a specialized service, technical accounting matters, and that's where uh, Patty is heading the division, I work uh, for her. And, uh, and also that uh, we also have uh, uh, equity uh, team. Somebody was asking managing uh, the, uh, the equity grants and all, that's something we can also assist you with, uh, with managing and at a much cheaper rate than the attorneys. So thank you very much. Oh, do you have a quick question? Uh, what stage are you coming? I'm seed through public company. Yeah. But I'd say our sweet spot is probably series seed through B. We have a lot, I don't know if yeah. Mike would say anything different, but um, no early. Well, not 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 necessarily like super 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 early. Yeah, more like you have some round of funding already. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, thank you. You guys are super attentive, which is wonderful, and we appreciate all the Q and A and all the questions. So thank you very much. Thank you.